Alright, so welcome everyone to the Tomcat track. So this first presentation is going to give a state of the Tomcat project. I took some content from the presentation from Mac Mark Thomas, who usually does that part of the presentation. And then I go on to the new features that were recently introduced to Tomcat. So I'm Danny Moshera, I have worked on Tomcat for quite a while now, almost 20 years, but not, not quite. I'm an ASF member um, since probably 2003 or something like that. Okay, so the content is that first we are going to look at the state of the project and delve into the important features that were added. So quite a bit of OpenSSL related stuff, HDP2, clustering, embedded got improved as well, and a lot of more features. Last, we are going to conclude with the future plans starting with future additions to the nine branch and then moving on maybe to the next major branch. So first the state of the project, so the foundation is 20 years old and Tomcat is also now 20 years old. So please join me in, I don't know, in a round of applause for this project. I didn't expect it. <laughs> Firstly, when I started contributing, I didn't know or expect it to be around like for 20 years because it's not as big as the uh, HTTP project. So it got basically started by a donation from Saint Microsystems who donated something that was called Tomcat 3. And to access this donation, the Jakarta Top Level project was, uh, was formed in August 99. So technically, the, the contribution occurred like in September. And the first actual Tomcat 3 release, like not from the CDS was in December, so it was the first release you could really download. It was, I think, a beta release, it wasn't stable at the time, but it came shortly after in 2000, early 2000. At the same time, many people weren't very happy about the code quality of, at least of some of the components that were in Tomcat. So they started the Tomcat 4 effort, which was a complete rewrite of the container portion of Tomcat and it started concurrently with Tomcat 3. So that started really in late 99 and early 2000. So it was also the 20th birthday of Catalina, uh, which is the solid container portion of Tomcat. So it's a bit similar. Actually, a lot of the code in Tomcat 4 is very similar to the code we have in Tomcat 9. So still there. All right, so in community news now, we have uh, a new PMC member, which is Igor Sapir right over there. Yay. <laughs> we also have a new committer, Winsan Ko, who contributed the Korean translation for the project. Uh, we really value non-code contribution like this one. Basically, it's really useful. So, for example, like we have um, a translation project going on, and it could really use your help. help. Uh, like and we only have three complete languages at the moment, for example, so French, Korean, and Japanese. So if you want to contribute, like people who contribute a, a significant amount will become committers. So we really value this kind of contribution, just like code contributions. So now we have a lot of committers, uh, quite a number of which are active daily. And we have about 30 PMC members at last count. Over the year, obviously, it's been 20 years, a lot of have become inactive, but we still have quite a number of them still being there after all this time. Uh, we have an upcoming uh, TomcatCon event, major uh, track at the Berlin uh, conference, it will be called Apache EU. It's a ni in a nice location in Berlin, so you feel free to attend. You won't regret it, it's nice, right? Like. All right, it will be, I think, a one and a half, one and a half day track with a lot of uh, the same presentations, but some which will be new to that event. So as far as releases go, we have a monthly schedule for Tomcat 9 and Tomcat 8.5. So uh, obviously there are some flexibility, like if there's a major security problem or if you don't have enough features for the, for the round, it's pushed back for a a few weeks, but basically, if you expect a bug fix, you only wait to you only have to wait a few weeks before you get it in a formal release. Uh, we made the final uh, 
Euro release in July, uh, July uh, 18. Uh, that branch is now e uh, end of life and archived in the Git. So, so no more 80 eight releases. However, 70 releases uh, still get some re regular release schedule. But it's not as frequent as for Tomcat 85 or Tomcat 9. You only get one release every two or three months, depending on the needs and how many fixes we have and things like that. So similar to that, we have uh, Tomcat native releases and ModJK releases, which are really as needed when we have a major or a significant fix or a bunch of fixes we want to push out. We make a release, but otherwise there's no fixed schedule for that. Uh, you can check the latest change log at any time at that URL. Uh, it's generated by the command integration system of Apache. And basically, it allows checking if your uh, bug fix was committed. And if it's committed, obviously, it will be in the next release. Also, it, it will show exactly when the last release was made and stuff like that. So you'll know, how, you'll know when to expect your fix, basically. OK, so general project metrics. So typically, we don't have many bugs open. but. Uh, we fix quite a few bugs all the time. That's the reason why we have some few open bugs. Uh, we have quite a few enhancement requests. So basically, if you want uh, small stuff to look at in the Tomcat project and contribute, that's, on, uh, that's something you, could, like, you can look at. Go to Bugzilla, search for the enhancements, and you'll find quite a few of them you can work on. Overall, uh, that's a uh, average line of code we have in Tomcat, so it's not that big. Still significant to tackle the first time, I think. Okay, so the late, the last security issues which were for, which we are fixed. We don't have too much uh, very recent and very major at the moment. We had a CGI problem on Windows, which is kind of usual. And we also had, like, HTTP2 also has a lot of uh, numerous new, um, uh, it's a lot more complex than HTTP11, basically, and that opens uh, room for denial of service and uh, resource use problems. And so that uh, CV was a bunch of uh, HTTP2 denial of service class problems, like taking too much many resources for processing certain types of requests or frames and stuff like that. Uh, and those are older, you can look, look them up on the security page in the Tomcat website. Okay, so now we move on to the new feature that were recently introduced in Tomcat. So the first one I put is um, a TLS 1.3 support, which got added a few months ago. Basically, it requires OpenSSL 1.1 or uh, Java 11. Uh, so one of the important features of uh, TLS 1.3 is uh, request handshake authentication, which is a much modern way to send uh, certificate information from the client to the server or from the server to the client. Previously, it needed a, a full renegotiation of, the, uh, of TLS, which is a very expensive operation and very hacky in some ways. And now there's a much better way to do it. Uh, it only works with OpenSSL, though, since Java JSSC didn't implement it. So you have to use uh, uh, either the OpenSSL support for the NIO connectors or the API connector to use cross check authentication. And if you're talking about that in your, in your presentation, no. Okay, so then we added support for JSC configuration in the APR connector. The APR connector is uh, the fully native connector of Tomcat. Uh, it's a bit legacy at the moment, but for consistency, we wanted you to be able to switch from one connector to the other more easily. And one big problem is uh, the certificate and generally all the SSL configuration of the connector. And previously, if you wanted to use uh, the JSSC connector, you would use most likely a, key, a Java key store. And the Java key store uh, couldn't then be used in the APR connector. So now everything is in common. You can use your Java key store with the APR connector and vice versa. You can use the OpenSSL certificates with the uh, 
NIO connectors, and it's basically a lot, a lot easier to manage in the long run and more flexible. So it also has a shield, uh, I mean, similar uh, configuration between GSSC and OpenSSL for uh, the session configuration. Okay, so we made some announcements <laughs> to HTTP2. Uh, it's been a while, but I wanted to mention again still that uh, HTTP2 is uh, ready to use with Java 9. It won't work very fine out of the box with Java 8, since Java 8 and GSSC out of the box doesn't have LPL support. So basically, you won't be able to use uh, your browser like Chrome with uh, HTTP2 and Tomcat if you're using Java 8, you have to upgrade or use OpenSSL. So we made uh, reliability and security improvements, which was mentioned previously with the CVE. Uh, we also made uh, some improvements to the um, HTTP2 implementation using asynchronous I.O. and supported for NIO and NIO2. Basically, it allows um, to block less on I.O. essentially. So, for example, you can read frames uh, without blocking and write uh, without blocking in, ma in many cases as well. There's also a uh, more efficient uh, static file serving, kind of like SAN5, but uh, modernized to be able to uh, support framing. So as I mentioned, we are, uh, I, saw I also added an asynchronous I.O. support for NIO and F and FER. Uh, previously, it was NIO2 only. I found out it worked very well with the NIO connector. Uh, it doesn't work very well with the APR connector, <coughs> so it's disabled by default for that connector. Performance was lower, so which was kind of expected due to the APR, uh, API design. Basically, it has to use some uh, buffering internally, and that's very costly with the synchronous <coughs> IO, where you're not supposed to use that kind of buffering strategy. So the behavior for our connectors is now the same, and it's verified and tested, use and tested using the HTTP2 and WebSockets implementations. So something that was added, I think, a bit a while ago now, because it got you know, talked about already uh, in last year's Apache EU uh, conference, is the reactive I/O support. Basically, it allows uh, suspending and resuming the Servet 3.1 uh, input I/O event because uh, otherwise you know you get the on the day available and stuff events and you have to process them basically so it can cause some uh, some back pressure problems and all that kind of stuff so if you want uh, if you need if your backend needs more time to process events you can suspend and then resume later those events unfortunately that's not a standard part of the Servet API. So uh, support has been added for that in the WebSocket implementation, and it's automatically taken advantage of by some frameworks, like Spring has support for them. Uh, we hope it will be included in the next servlet specification, because originally like, uh, we had an API, an event-based API in Tomcat, but so it was planned for that support to be in, like suspend resume, and somehow it got forgotten in the, during the expert group work for servlet 3.1. And then later it's pretty hard to add again. So. Okay, so the in um, WebSocket, the support is done like on the WS session object. You have suspend and resume methods. It's very easy to use, actually. You just call suspend. Then you won't get any on data available events for the frame because you filter them. And then it will send events again if once you call <coughs> WS session resume. So it's really pretty easy to use. One quick question. Yes. Can you give me a use case on how you want to suspend events? Yeah, if you can process uh, them fast enough. Otherwise, you get swamped with IO and then you put too much pressure on your backend for no reason. So you just suspend them and restart processing later once basically your backend is less busy. Otherwise, you have no way to control the event flow and
and then, well, most of the time it will work because usually IO is lower, but you never know. Do you, you lose, do you lose data? Do you lose frames in the what is happening? No, no, it's buffered and but stuff. So uh, ultimately, it will block an IO. So I mean, IO itself will block. So. Okay, so one other feature we had in. Um, HE Fujino is on Kyo this year, but she's the one who's been doing that. Uh, he's been revamping the static cluster membership configuration. It was a huge mess. Previously, you had to have a huge configuration and interceptors and whatever to maintain a static list of cluster members. Now you have a simple membership service to do that, and it's really much, much cleaner. So you can have a look if you're interested in having a static cluster. It can be useful in, a, uh, in cloud or whatever. I don't know. But yeah, if you wanted to do it previously, it was a huge mess. So that membership implementation is really useful for that. So Christopher Schultz added cluster traffic encryption. It was a lot of work on his part, but thanks. It was an often requested feature, actually. Uh, you have to use an interceptor uh, to achieve that encryption and it's pretty easy. You use a shared encryption key again uh, across your cluster. Uh, Christopher will be able to, ask, uh, to answer a question about its use if you're interested. So also uh, we noticed like in the cloud, in cloud environment, uh, maintaining a, cluster, a membership list is pretty problematic. So we added membership services, just like the static one, uh, but designed for clouds and, uh, and Kubernetes aware. So that it's a bit easier to use. Basically, the idea is that you would add this membership service and it will discover using the appropriate APIs what your uh, cluster nodes are. So we have community support for that, which is the de facto standard as a for uh, container orchestration. So it uses a Kubernetes REST API, so it's now supported almost everywhere. Produces a JSON list of members, then it's processed. Start in st inside the cluster membership service, and then it automatically populates the cluster list as a cluster membership list so that all your uh, cluster members deployed in your cloud will be discovered automatically. Uh, we have a presentation on that at the conference. Uh, I forgot to update the, the year, but yeah, it will be this year as well. jean Frédéric will be giving it. So. It's been integrated for a while now, so now it's actually tested and it works. Because there were some bugs like in the initial release. Okay, uh, something I added also is better uh, configuration support probability for embedded mostly. Uh, it allows abstracting basically the location of the configuration files and resources. For example, obviously the main configuration files like server.xml, web.xml, whatever, but also items like your, uh, your key stores, your certificates, all that kind of resources you would want to load during the configuration process. So everything now goes through the, a standard implementation, which is pretty much better defined than before, because previously, depending on the part of the code you were looking at, it would look in slightly different uh, locations. For example, the certificates could be loaded from arbitrary URLs, but not other configuration files. So now it's all going through a single uh, API and implementation. And it will look in those uh, locations in order. So first you get the Catalina base, then you can uh, you get a class loader lookup, then you are resolution, and uh, you also have an extra um, layer of resolution for server.xml because of uh, how it was done in embedded. It uses that local legacy location that probably nobody knows about. But <laughs> 
it does it for compatibility <laughs> just in case. Basically, when you remove the legacy stuff that you think nobody uses, you get people complaining on the user list immediately after. So <coughs> we try to avoid removing legacy stuff for no reason. So uh, we tried to improve also uh, Tomcat embedded for that kind of use. Uh, basically, the Tomcat class, which is the main class you would use for embedded, you can now set this uh, configuration source. And so you have the API call here. And it basically, it will allow you on Tomcat embedded, which will be still managed by the same embedded API you're used to to use a regular server XML for its bootstrap because in some cases it's much easier to do the server XML rather than replicate everything in code especially if you have complex SSL configurations writing that in code is pretty complicated and pretty error prone so it would be easier in that case to use a server.xml pretty small, easy to parse to do that it's a small cost to pay but will make your life a lot easier and avoid paying too much configuration inside your code. So another, uh, another related thing is that I tried to improve Tomcat container support, like make it uh, easier for you to build your Tomcat images and play with whatever you want in containers. So I added uh, a Maven-based uh, packaging which produces basically a fat Tomcat jar. So instead of having multiple jars like in Tomcat standalone, you have no Tomcat single Tomcat jar. So you can add your, uh, in that packaging, you can add your custom components and stuff and web apps and Tomcat native and your own package uh, into your container image. So we provide uh, an example container image and uh, with some monitoring included because sometimes it's a bit hard to configure Choloka and Prometheus support. So there's a good example of that. Uh, that image is also configured uh, using that previously that support, yeah, that configuration source support to use the usual server.xml, web.xml, context.xml. <coughs> Okay, about uh, cloud functionality, um, it means a lot of, uh, about uh, Eclipse microprofile. Basically, the cloud expects a lot of cloud providers, actually, and the utilities except, uh, expect microprofile help and metrics support. So I figured, like, getting there with Tomcat was a bit difficult, uh, because basically you need uh, CDI2 support and JAXRS support and it's a bit complicated to add it to a regular Tomcat so basically I tried to produce easier packaging for this uh, using the open uh, the open webbins uh, Tomcat project and the Apache CXF uh, project I produced a uh, kind of Fadger based uh, support which can now be added uh, more easily to a Tomcat instance. Uh, there's documentation on that. Uh, in the Tomcat documentation, you have a pretty straightforward uh, path to adding, uh, for example, help support to your web app. Okay, also recently, um, some guy on the mailing list asked about Grow support like the ability to generate a Tomcat native image out of your Tomcat container. That sounds like a bit hard. I tried, I tried it briefly and it absolutely wasn't working. Then we had a, an event in Brussels, like a hackathon which was sponsored by the European Commission. And then I, I noticed a lot of people there were actually interested in Go, like three-thirds of the people attending the, that event. So we started working on it, and yeah, it wasn't working any better. There was a lot of work and competitive issues and problems. So we made some progress at the event, and then, um, but it motivated me basically to continue looking at it and working on it. So I made some progress, and I think I have resolved most of the competitivity issue. So it, will, uh, it allows generating native, uh, basically it's a native Tomcat. 
that you can use either standalone or embedded with a lot of limitations, but it's pretty powerful. So I have a presentation on that tomorrow at the same time. And make demos on how to generate native images and all that, all that kind of crazy stuff. So. Okay, so another feature we had, uh, it's not very exciting, it's actually kind of boring and painful, but like we worked on the Java, Jakarta EETCKs, which were released by Oracle. Uh, it allowed verifying compatibility, investigate problems, either in the TCK or in Tomcat, fix Tomcat bugs, like we do some fixes in WebSockets in particular. And we reported TCK problems, which I did, I don't think got fixed because we were busy with whatever. And so we really investigated the compatibility of, uh, with the latest specifications, which we, which we couldn't do before. Okay, and another feature is that the background threads used by Tomcat were refactored. It's not super interesting, but it allowed reducing the amount of threads that a uh, regular Tomcat instance would use. It would save usually a couple of threads. Uh, also, it's more reliable since basically you can, with an executor, a bit like the Java e API on executors, um, yeah, on the scheduling executor, you get more reliability because you have uh, another scheduled event watching the main uh, scheduled event. And if your uh, container uh, process basically died because of whatever, uh, so the, monitor, the monitoring uh, scheduled event will restart the main one. Uh, previously, if your background thread died because of an uncut exception, it would die forever and you had no way to restart it. So that should actually improve reliability in addition to saving a couple of threads. That's the right way. All right. So I talked about or I talked about it already, <laughs> but you can really co contribute to that. It's an internationalization project for Apache Tomcat, which was started as a co-editor by Mark Thomas. Anybody can join. It's very easy. Uh, we hope to fix uh, all the inter all the non-international on the non-international strings for Tomcat. Hopefully it's done, but when you look at it, you find all you always find one if that isn't done somewhere. Right now we have three languages, French, Korean, and Japanese, which are fully done. For some reason, Chinese isn't done yet. I, I expected it to be since there were a lot of people joined up. Uh, there was a lot of activity and it stopped basically halfway. So half of the Chinese translation isn't done. We have the German translation in a decent shape and the Spanish one as well. So feel free to contribute. There hasn't been a lot of progress lately, but at least it's a very good way to start contributing. <coughs> uh, something that is useful for developers, uh, we migrated to Git and GitHub in particular. So the new uh, URLs are stale, so you get the GitHub URL, and then that's the internal uh, Git mirror of a uh, uh, Git instance of Apache. I do, uh, both are synced, so you can basically pull and push from both. Obviously it's more modern. Uh, you have to, uh, yeah, you have three main branches, master, 85 and 70. And the CDN repository is an uh, archive. Yeah, so basically what you can do now, obviously if you in your GitHub, do a pull request against Tomcat, we look at it. <coughs> okay, we have a lot of more new features, like for example, we have uh, Tomcat users reloading. Previously, well, you needed to either use JMX or something like that to reload your Tomcat users. Now it's automatic. It's automatically done. The uh, Tomcat users.xml is monitored and reloaded automatically. Uh, if you have big web apps and you pre-compile JSPs, be happy to learn it's not much threaded. So basically, it means it will compute four times or eight times faster, depending on how many cores you have. Uh, for the NAU2 connector, uh, the acceptor thread was removed. It's basically it was totally useless with the uh, NAU2 model, which is asynchronous. Instead of using a thread to accept with a uh, blocking operation, we just use uh, an asynchronous accept the way it's supposed to happen, basically, with NAU2. 
so I, I mentioned it, I think, yeah, APR supports and JSSCP stores, I forgot to remove that one. Uh, we also have something that I call, uh, okay, optional server listeners, basically, kind of, uh, once you have a, a server listener in server.xml, it's supposed to work, like, for example, you have a listener that initialize some uh, library, like, for example, I talked about CDI2 support, you have a listener to enable open web beans. If open web beans is not present and your listener isn't very careful about it, uh, it will throw a class load exception if open web beans is not present and it will crash. So now you can set uh, an extra property on your server listeners so that basically it will notify you instead of crashing the, uh, the Tomcat startup, that open web beans isn't uh, there. Uh, the general idea is we would eventually add um, configuration for common server listeners, like for example for the CDI2 support, inside the default server.xml, and it will not crash for instance, but tell you, you can add uh, open web in support if you want, just drop the jar and it will work. So that's for general use usability. Uh, Mark Thomas added uh, a very useful uh, feature uh, allowed uh, disabling JMX for embedded use cases and raw use cases, I should mention, I'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh, directory listing sorting was, uh, was added. Congratulations, Christopher. It's pretty useful. I think, I think people had, a, had asked for it uh, in the past. So, very nice. Uh, we have uh, better HTTP2 defaults that is more reliable, less memory hungry, less crazy on threads, and all that, all that kind of stuff. It's really, I mean, if you're using the defaults, um, the previous one weren't very secure since in many cases they would use way too many resources, which would cause uh, obviously a problem for your servers. It's only defaults, so. Uh, something that is important for security, uh, when you close uh, a socket, previously we had some components which were recycled, but they retained references on their underlying objects and things like that, so you could get into trouble. So now the socket wrapper is fully decoupled, decoupled uh, when it went done. Uh, We also added support for a feature called Sensei Cookie Attribute. I don't remember what it's called, it's a security feature. Forget about it. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to the future plans about Tomcat 9x and, and .next. So that's where you can contribute. Obviously, a lot of these features are big features, so they are probably not the ideal beginner thing, but you can try. So the main, uh, one of the main immediate plans is for HTTP2 improvements for resources using profiling, try to maintain uh, decent resource use. Since as I said, HTTP2 is a lot more complex than HTTP1.1. Obviously it uses more resources, more memory. Obviously it also provides faster responsi uh, responsiveness for users using your website, but it's you still have to dedicate resources and, uh, and things to it, but we try to minimize it. Uh, for example, one feature that we will work on uh, soon is uh, HTTP2 prioritiz prioritization of frames, which isn't done fully well. Uh, it will allow a fully dynamic, uh, very, very dynamic websites to have better control on the way uh, the content is arranged when it's sent to the server, uh, to the client, for example, it allows uh, specifying that certain frames are high priority and they should be sent before uh, finding requests that would be otherwise sending frames. It's pretty complicated, complex to do, but we try to achieve that. Also, we will try to uh, implement HTTP extensions as they come. So uh, another possible uh, big work is uh, quality cleanups and improvements. 
we have the, uh, the APR connector and we can't really uh, all agree on its status. Everybody kind of agrees it's his legacy now, but we're still wondering if, if we should remove it or not. And the same goes for AJP, which is um, the protocol which was used to connect for to a front-end server like HCPD. Now we recommend using HTTP instead of AJP, so maybe we can remove AJP, but it has a lot of users. Yeah. Because it's complex and it doesn't support all the features that we need. How you can run now with HTTP We prefer that people use HTTP instead of AJP. What do you suggest that you continue a better to yeah. 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 Well, it's custom and proprietary kind of, so we kind of don't want to continue maintaining it, especially since it doesn't support a lot of features that we need uh, for more uh, advanced protocols. So it's binary, but you still need to encode and decode, and there is yeah. no saving. You know. Yeah. Nowadays, it's a bit. The savings are pretty small, so. No, I was very disappointed when I tried to it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it won't get any benefit, I think, or even it might be worse. Um, it limits some uh, highly dynamic use cases, like you can't get any two-way communications and all that stuff. It's really old now, so we didn't, we never updated the protocol, so basically it doesn't support everything we need to do. So. And the problem is the uh, the major problem is security. Yeah, for security, uh, the recommendation was to use an encrypted uh, tunnel, and so it's pretty annoying to set up. While on the HTTP, obviously, you can configure security in the proper way. So. When is that expected to happen? We have no idea. There's still no decision on that. Basically, there are question marks here and here because there's been no decision. It's been talked about for years now. APR and AJP for removal. It might happen in Tomcat 10, but we don't know yet. So no decision has been made. Basically, there's no big interest in removing stuff often. So, but some people use them. So, yes. What are the consequences of removing the APR? The APR uh, well, you won't, uh, the APR connector is still in some cases the fastest Tomcat connector, but by far it's a bit the fastest. So you lose access to the fastest Tomcat connector, which is a bit of a problem. So um, the question is, the, the more is it? Yeah, because it's a big bunch of uh, specific native code and APIs and it crashes sometimes. Rarely, but... Now you're not talking about the Tomcat native. Uh, no. No, 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 no. It's just the APR connector. And I use OpenSSL. Uh, it uses the OpenSSL API and it's not impacted by the APR in connector removal. Uh, another benefit of this removal is that we remove the APR dependency by Tomcat Native would only be a wrapper for OpenSSL, nothing more. And that's kind of important for uh, container environments as well. <laughs> so. If we don't need it, I mean, if we just need it for a bit of extra performance and a lot of reliability problems, it's probably not worth keeping it around. So that is the reasoning, basically. <coughs> so yeah, native improvements. So that's for Tomcat native. So if we remove the APR dependency, that would be good. Uh, we would want to add support for the OpenSSL clones. There are quite a few of them. So. Uh, modernize, that means uh, use more uh, modern uh, C features and things like that, especially if we remove the APR dependencies, if we use some uh, helper uh, APIs from APRs, they would have to be replaced with more modern uh, CMIP uh, equivalents. Uh, another quite uh, revolutionary item which was proposed by Mark Thomas is to use the support project Panama, which basically removes GNI and replaces it with uh, an API not unlike uh, traditional Java reflection. It's a lot more verbose. I don't think it would be as fast as GNI, but it would also be a lot nicer since we won't have 
we don't have uh, the need for any uh, native wrapper to install your Tomcat, your OpenSSL, anything to work. So that's pretty cool. No Tomcat native to compile or install or whatever. So there's a pretty big benefit there, but it's very hard to do so. I don't know if it will happen. Very ambitious at least. So next up in the very ambitious features department, don't start working on that first. It's a bad idea, don't worry. So it's HTTP3 support. Uh, it needs a lot of uh, UDP work and things like that. Most likely at the moment, we use a, a separate native library to do the quick support. And maybe the queue pack, I'm not sure yet. But there's a problem at the UDP level. Because uh, Java can't support uh, UDP features that are needed since now UDP is kind of intertwined with uh, TLS. So it's not possible to implement it with the current uh, UDP API in uh, Java. Also, in IO2 doesn't support UDP, so there's a problem for that connector. So we should probably go the native library way. Okay, uh, next up is the uh, eventual Jakarta EE support. So that would be uh, to support the next uh, server web sockets and uh, whatever uh, API related APIs are introduced. Uh, it will also have consequences like moving to the Jakarta star namespace for the, uh, for the core API instead of using the Javax uh, server APIs. So that's a big, a big step. As usual, it will happen in Tomcat 10, obviously, from the back 40. At the moment, I have no idea what uh, uh, future spec will contain or the new features that will be introduced in that spec. In the spec. Yeah, but it's not happening at the moment, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, obviously, because previously we had uh, like the Java E cycle took forever, and I mean, delays were the norm. So, yeah, if it could be a bit more frequent, not too frequent, if they will start racing every three months, it would be a problem. <laughs> but yeah, if they can start racing on a predictable uh, schedule, because once you get a, a spec issue, I need it? Oh no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so previously, like, if you run into a spec issue or a clarification needed, it will never be fixed, basically. Or at least fixed, like, four years later or so. It's a bit of a problem. Uh, we could do a lot of configuration improvements in the next Tomcat version. Like, we have a huge amount of attributes deep application now, especially for SSL. It's very confusing for users when they try to migrate configurations. It's been improved now a bit, at least in using warning or messages, but it's very, very error prone. When you remix the, you know, the new SSL configuration with the old one, it will break horribly. Uh, I wrote system properties removal. Now I'm aware some people like some system properties, the things that we don't want to have had uh, configurations that is in system properties but not in server.xml so we want to drop system properties as much as needed maybe we will get they will be reintroduced later but they will be done in a better way hopefully uh, there's a plan also to add additional jmx bins which are very useful for monitoring and management uh, we also push back some uh, changes with some to bear some risks like changing the default encoding is usually breaking stuff, so it's been pushed to Tomcat 10. And a lot of similar stuff, like the extension validator, which is not needed. So as you can see, 20 years later, we're still improving stuff, adding features, planning new releases. Um, pretty happy, so I don't know how long Tomcat will continue, maybe another 20 years. All right, till I retire. <laughs> so, thanks for your time. Now, if you have some questions. All right, I'm done then. All right, thank you.